Now, if you attended a great meeting of the guild masters, you would attend something that was very interesting. You would find these men gathered in <coughs> the communion house or in the community center. And here, on certain intervals, prescribed by their laws and their traditions, they broke bread together. And because not one of these was greater than another, they were seated around a circular table. And in the midst of the table was the gill cup. And this gill cup had on the, on the lip, all around the edge of the cup, little hooks. And on each of these hooks was the crest and shield of a gill master. This cup was filled with wine and each of the masters drank from the cup, performing a ritualistic Eucharist and rededicating their lives to the great service of the architects of the universe. They were worshipping the building. Their laws were their own. Their secrets were inviolate. Their mysteries were perpetuated. And the power of these men can well be imagined when we realize, for example, that a few days after he placed his famous bow on the church door, Martin Luther, who was by an instance a guildsman because he belonged to the guild of the watchmakers. Soon after he had uh, made his public statement against the sale of papal indulgences, Luther was called before his guild. <coughs> and here in solemn assembly, he was placed under the protection of the guilds and given a medal, which was always wear and which he should show in time of emergency. And from that time on, although Luther had a hard time, he was under the protection of this body and was one of the few of the great reformers of the period who survived. The guilds were very powerful. Now here is a guild which we know definitely was dedicated to building buildings, but we also know from the inscriptions which they placed upon the stones, from the mysterious carvings they hid far in recondite places in the masonry, from their wonderful use of emblems and figures, that they were more than just buildings. They were the perpetuation of the secret schools of architecture known as the Dionysian Artificers in Greece, the Vitruvian Collegia in Rome, and the famous architects called the Cobacene Builders, who had their refuge in Lake Como. These were all initiate schools from antiquity, concealing the secrets of human regeneration under the story of architecture. Now here's one group of you. Now let us pass for a moment to another group. And this is the group of the chemists. The doctors, the chemists, and those who had to do with research in metals, metallurgy, the things of that nature, all who touched fire as a means of working the elements of their craft were bound together. And this mysterious body of chemists, although it did not build cities at the foot of cathedrals to do things of that nature, was an integrated body. And it was also in close relation to the crafts of the builders. After a great deal of research, I was finally able to recover ancient drawings of the original doors of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. The reason this was important was that the original doors, which were removed at the time of the French Revolution, that these doors, which were cast in bronze, and I suppose it would have been the work of the devil. All such interesting things were at that time. <laughs> All these doors was the complete failure of alchemical transmutation. The doors were a mass of hermetic symbols. Now these doors could not have been placed there by the chemists, unless these chemists had also been in very intimate association with the cathedral builders. It was part of the same type of guild. Another guild that is of very great interest to us is the bookmakers' guild, the printers. And if you study the columns and trade emblems and symbols of the great presses like Gutenberg and Fust and Caxton, you will find that each one of these presses had its master's mark, and that these book builders and makers were also bound together in a fraternity, which is the reason why it was possible through the medieval and early modern period for ciphers and secret devices of all kinds to be introduced into books. This could not have taken place had it not been for the guilds, this tremendous body of men who were bound together by a common purpose. And that common purpose was the restoration of the golden age in the world. <coughs> now, when we go directly and strictly into the alchemical symbolism, we come upon a number of informations. 
And in order to trace these intimations, we have to go step by step to an inconceivable uh, labyrinth of clues and hints and implications. We know, for example, <coughs> that the term adept, as we know it in the West, is first applied to the alchemical masters. As the various building crafts elected a grand master, the alchemists elected or appointed or accepted into their bodies certain masters of their arts, whom they call addicts. In alchemy, this term has a very special and definite meaning. It should not be confused with the Eastern or Oriental concept of adept, or even the Rosicrucian or mystical concept. The adept was the master alchemist, or one fully possessed of the mysteries of the art. Now in the build of craft, you have the masters, the fellow craft, and the apprentices. In the alchemical guild, you have the adept, the illuminate, and the initiate. Those were the three degrees. And uh, these represented those who had attained to one or two or even the third step of knowledge <coughs> concerning the mysteries of chemistry. The adepts gathering together in the performance of their equivalent to the master bill of Eucharist, gathering around the great gill cup, which in this case was the wonderful alembic of alchemy, also appointed their ruler, who was called the Adept King. And as one of the very rare tracts, which is almost unobtainable, uh, states that in alchemy there was the King Emperor, the supreme ruler of the entire school scattered throughout the world, that under him were the princes of the blood, the highest Adept masters. Below them were the dukes, the earls, the barons, the knights, and the squires of this hierarchy. And therefore, it was customary to refer to a certain alchemist as a duke or as an earl, depending upon his place in this great mysterious empire, which existed in a strange dimension extending through all other empires, binding them together by a strange level of traditions. Now, material relating to this, as I have said, is exceedingly hard to find. We find a few references in, of it, uh, to it in Kunrath, a very early alchemical master. And we also find references to it in a work called the Addicts in alchemy, a very interesting and early work. But uh, in wandering through one of the old libraries of Europe, <coughs> I was able to find this manuscript, which perhaps comes a little nearer to some of this problem than we will find most anywhere else. And as far as I'm able to find out, this is the only copy of it that exists. And this is called The True Adepts, the Illuminates, and Initiates of the Hermetic Arts. This is in the form of a kind of uh, biographical uh, glossary. It is almost in the form of a certain biographical who's who in alchemy. And from the first page of this, we learn the definitions as they were used within the body of the alchemical school. The term addict is properly applied to one who has learned the great work and who has performed it. That is the proper term for an addict. The term illuminate or illuminist is probably related to one who has experienced the mystery of the work but does not know how it is performed. This is a rather curious uh, differentiation. The term initiate is one who has achieved to the knowledge of the method, but has not performed the work. Now this uh, is the way in which the guild of the chemists was divided. Following this 
is a list premised by the fact that it must always and ever be remembered that there are false addicts, false illuminates, and false initiates, but that the genuine ones can be determined only by those who have the knowledge to investigate the secret marks and symbols. Then we have here a list of the adepts of the school, both imaginary and historical, and also the degrees of their development within the school. We learn from this book, for instance, that according to the alchemical tradition, Moses was an adept. We learn that Solomon was an adept. And this brings us very close to the fact that Solomon was also supposed to have been a great architect and a master of those mysteries. Then we learn also, as we go on uh, through these lists, some of the other names involved in this. The Apostle John, a sublime illuminate. Hermes, an adept. Orpheus, an adept. Apollonius of Rhodes, an initiate. Homer, an initiate. Ptolemy, an illuminate. Virgil, an initiate. You can go right down through this book and you will find all of the principal names and their ranks in the school. We also learn that Avicenna was an initiate. Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus, was an adept. St. Thomas Aquinas was an initiate. Roger Bacon was an initiate. Raymond Lilly was an adept. I won't try to read them all because many of the names are not particularly important to us now. But this work carried on through all of the different steps of alchemy, pointing out that these different teachers, masters of the schools, were actually bound together in a pattern. Now when we take an alchemical tradition and we come to the discovery that it includes Orpheus and Homer, we know that we are not dealing with chemistry, because these men were not chemists. We were dealing with an esoteric system of which the alchemical schools in Europe were comparatively recent development. Clearly, an illuminate. Michael Meyer, in the class. One of the interesting things we find as we go along through here is that a number of names that are a little better known to us are also to be found.